In 2011, Lisa Larson's life changed forever. The Portland, Oregon native was forced to flee from her home to escape her abusive husband. And with nowhere left to turn, Larson quickly became one of Portland's estimated 4,000 homeless citizens, according to the 2015 Portland Housing Bureau. However, she didn't stay homeless for long. After a few weeks on the street, Larson moved into Dignity Village, a place where she and 59 other homeless people live, with dignity, off the streets and out of shelters. Founded in 2000 and located northeast of downtown Portland, Dignity Village is a government-sanctioned community of 60 micro-homes, each no bigger than 10 by 13 feet, that center around a communal building that houses showers, bathrooms, a kitchen, and a TV. An in-depth analysis of Dignity Village conducted by New York Times columnist Tim Murphy, published through BuzzFeed on January 15, 2015, explains that the village offers a modicum of safety, stability, warmth, autonomy, and privacy, all at a much reduced cost. And other cities are starting to take note. The National Law Center for Homelessness and Poverty estimates that there are over 100 similar villages across the U.S., and they continue to spread. Al Jazeera of February 7, 2015 notes that Seattle has begun plans on three such villages as a way to combat their urban homelessness. And considering Dignity Village pioneered this concept and has been the basis for many other cities, it is critical that we gain a better understanding of their model. So today, we will examine the history of the village, see its current operations, and draw implications. Because as Bradford Powell, a Dignity Village resident states, the current shelter system is broken because it does not allow people the dignity that is needed to heal. When Lisa first arrived at Dignity Village, she told herself, get a job, get safe, and get out. However, now, five years later, and she still lives at the village and works as a CEO for their self-governed community. To better understand how Dignity Village got to where it is today, we will look at the history of the village and the facilities it provides. According to the National Coalition for the Homeless, Dignity Village didn't start as a village at all. In December of 2000, a group of eight homeless men and women created a small tent city called Dignity Camp. And in 15 years, the mission statement hasn't changed at all. Provide a safe, sanitary, self-governed place to live as an alternative to the already crowded shelters and jails of Portland. And after being forced to move by the city and police department six different times, the city council and mayor of Portland offered the villagers a small plot of government-sanctioned land just seven miles from downtown. And after their permanent move in 2001, the village partnered with Street Roots, a local nonprofit that helped get them on their feet. Now, though, they have their own 501c3 nonprofit that raises funds and pays the bills. The village consists of 60 micro homes. They are built and decorated by the residents using recycled materials and meet all of Portland's housing standards. On average, they're about 10 by 13 feet, which is just big enough to fit a bed and some small personal belongings. On the outside, though, no two homes look the same. Some are decorated with bright blue flowers, and others sport neon orange stripes. And these creative outlets allow the villagers to look at their houses as homes. Resident Nancy Mataz, who also serves on the village's board of directors, calls Dignity Village self-sustaining. We pay all of our bills, we make our own rules, and we are self-governed, she states. To better understand how Dignity Village functions on a day-to-day -day basis, we will look first at how it is funded and upkept, and second, how it is governed. First, Dignity Village is largely self-sustaining. The villagers are entirely responsible for the upkeep of the village. They must do daily volunteer work, like picking up trash or working shifts at the 24-hour security booth. And they're responsible for about $20 a month out of pocket, to contribute to the shared living space. Author Andrew Hibben outlines the atmosphere of Dignity Village in his 2014 book, Tent City Urbanism. There is an impressive array of raised garden beds, he states, 
and the villagers collect, bundle, and sell firewood to contribute funds to the village. While they do allow donations, aside from allowing them to use the land, the city does not contribute to Dignity Village. The idea is to show that these people are capable of working together to create a better life. Next, Dignity Village is entirely self-governed by its formerly homeless residents. They rely on a 100% democratic voting system to make decisions regarding operations and oversight. The rules are simple, as explains a 2012 documentary of the village. There is no violence, no theft, no drugs or alcohol, no constant disruptive behavior, and everyone must contribute to the village. If these rules are broken, they will vote to evict villagers on a one strike and you're out basis. So if they get caught bringing in beer, threatening other residents, or fighting, you'll be asked to leave and they cannot return. Five years ago, when Lisa got to Dignity Village, she was broke and did not have a place to live. Now though, she's back on her feet and actually holds an administrative role within the village. And she is just one of their many success stories. And this leads us to examine potential implications and limitations. First, the Dignity Village model forces us to consider homelessness as a sustained institutional problem. Traditional shelters rebuff the notion of homelessness as a temporary condition. But by converting to the tiny home model, Dignity Village has the opportunity to do something that traditional shelters can't. Provide long-term stability. A homeless man named Andrew told CNN on May 16, 2014, that in the minds of most homeless people, shelter is just one small step away from jail. With the long lines and limited beds, traditional shelters might work well for someone experiencing short-term homelessness. But for the perpetually homeless, Dignity Village and others like it offer a solution, not just a treatment to their condition. Next, the self-governed model of Dignity Village sparks questions regarding autonomy and moral authority. The aforementioned National Coalition for the Homeless explains that their system has created a strong sense of community. However, an evaluation of Dignity Village for the Portland Housing Bureau notes that violence and theft are dealt with effectively. But the village struggles with how to handle smaller problems that require a more nuanced response. And this has led Queeksty Village, a similar model in Olympia, Washington, to turn to a local nonprofit for leadership. The aforementioned BuzzFeed op-ed notes that this has led to much more thorough oversight, like mandated urine testing for all residents. But while this may increase compliancy, it also decreases autonomy implying that the homeless are not capable or deserving of such authority. Finally, this model might be working to make homelessness invisible. Laura Chapel, a UC Berkeley urban planning professor, speaks against the placement of these camps. You're perpetuating the isolation of the homeless by keeping him here, she, sits, she states. And Chapel is right. Places like Dignity and Queeksty are located miles away from urban centers. For example, traditional shelters are typically located in the center of downtown, forcing the city to come face to face with their homelessness. But this lack of visibility has the potential to create the illusion of solving homelessness without doing anything more than simply moving the homeless masses. So today, we have looked at the history of Dignity Village seen its current operations and drawn implications. Dignity Village continues to do exactly what its name implies, allow its residents to live with dignity. All right, good luck with the rest of your final rounds, Courtney. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Alyssa, do you have to set anything up? I do not. All right, well, as soon as Courtney takes off, we'll Go down to you.
Melissa. The 19 residents of Leith, North Dakota see their registered ghost town as beautiful, despite the rundown houses and the abandoned school. Looking up from their front porches at night, they can see the stars for miles. With the town nearly extinct, the citizens yearn for a way to get Leith back on the map. Until, in May 2012, their wish was granted. According to the BBC of January 15, 2014, Craig Cobb, a 62-year-old white supremacist, saw Leith as the perfect opportunity to turn his vision into reality. The Missouri native's plan was simple. Move to Leith, quietly acquire cheap land throughout the town, secretly <coughs> invite other white supremacists to move there, and eventually create an all-white enclave called Cobbsville. Frighteningly, it almost worked. According to the Huffington Post of September 13, 2013, Cobb's quiet plan was turned upside down when the Southern Poverty Law Center, or SPLC, contacted Leith's mayor to reveal who Cobb really was. The two-year battle for control in Leith exemplified the disturbing power of hate groups on a national level. According to the SPLC's most recent data in 2014, there are 939 active hate groups in the U.S., a number that has nearly doubled since 2001. Specifically, after Barack Obama took office in 2008, the number of white supremacist groups has increased by 54%. The story of Leith exposed the fragility of small communities and the power of hateful ideologies, prompting a significant First Amendment debate. To better understand the attempted takeover of this town, we'll first look at Cobb's master plan, then see how the town fought back and finally discuss implications for the tiny town in the middle of North Dakota that became the epicenter of racial tensions in the United States. In an interview with USA Today on August 30th, 2013, Cobb described his visions for a pool in a park in Leith dedicated to Nazism. We'd like to repair the town and make it beautiful again, he said. Let's look at the first stages of Cobb's story and then see how it progressed. First, the New York Times of September 13, 2013, states Cobb was drawn to Leith because of the oil reserve in Bismarck just a few miles away, which could provide jobs for himself and his future supporters. He bought a $5,000 two-story house in Leith, moved there in May 2012, and sneakily snatched up 12 plots of cheap land. The citizens were excited that someone was so eager to invest in their little town. Little did they know, Cobb was setting up social media sites and Craigslist ads, enticing other white supremacists to take refuge in Leith, where he would sell them land for as cheap as $1. Mm -hmm. On one website, he wrote that one day leftist journalists and non-whites would face arrest in the town. Now all he needed was for people to show up. Next, Cobb slowly unraveled his plans to the citizens of Leith. One by one, he marked his land with swastika flags, and as he told CNN of September 20th, 2013, eventually they waved throughout the entire town. Cobb said that Leith would be extraordinarily beautiful at night because there would be floodlit flags of all the formerly white nations of the earth. The Guardian of January 28th, 2015, states Cobb followers began arriving in Leith in September with the leader of the National Socialist Movement, Jeff Schott, and hate crime fugitive Kynan Dutton, along with his wife and five children. Cobb was close to gaining enough white supremacists in the town to legally run the town in government. But on a wider scale, he wanted to use Leith as a case study for similar communities to come. Cobb acknowledged in the aforementioned USA Today interview that his plan had downfalls, but said, even if I am the only resident in Leith forever, then white consciousness has been raised. We'll look at the next phase in Cobb's plan, and then see how the town fought back. First, Bobby Harper, Leith's only black resident, told the International Business Times of September 7, 2013, that Leith was a place where everyone got along. We could be, basically leave our doors unlocked, and there was no fear. But it became his worst nightmare when Cobb would yell abhorrent racial slurs during town meetings at he and his wife Cheryl, who is white. 
With Cobb only needing 17 more votes to gain governmental majority in the town, he and Dutton would drunkenly terrorize town meetings with the intention of stirring up controversy. Dutton was finally removed by the town sheriff when he began screaming white power. Meanwhile, the fear of the lead citizens escalated. I have learned to shoot every gun in the house, one stated, and several began sleeping with multiple guns by their bedside at night. Next. Chaos continued in length when protesters from around the country filled the streets. The citizens knew they had to make a decision. They could let Cobb take over and dissolve the town or find a loophole in his plan. Business Insider of February 25th, 2014 states the town first hired a legal team to come up with a strategy to force Cobb and his followers off their land. Because many of Cobb's followers were simply camping out in Winnebago's, the legal team created a new city ordinance that stated Cobb and his followers had 30 days to obtain potable or running water on their properties, both a time-consuming and expensive pro process. Not long after, Cobb and Dutton began protesting the ordinance by patrolling the town with rifles, the last straw before both facing arrest. Cobb eventually received a plea deal, including a felony terrorizing charge. Now, with a GPS tracker on him at all times, he will be thrown back in jail if he comes within 500 feet of leave. But the story isn't over yet. Let's discuss implications for the spectacle of hate groups in space. First, Craig Cobb gained multiple e media interviews following Leith's story. After the premiere of the Welcome to Leith documentary at the Sundance Film Festival this January, there was even a Q&A session with the audience where they Skyped in Craig Cobb. The LA Times of January 30th, 2015 notes one woman from the audience shouted, this man is a dangerous white supremacist and I think giving him a platform and trying to make a spectacle out of all this is appalling. Cobb's story reminds us that for hate groups, the spectacle is the goal. The citizens of Leith were put in a tough spot because in trying to shut him down, they were giving Cobb the attention he was seeking. Thus, they had to find a loophole in local law in order to ruin his plan, a decision that may have been ethically questionable. This forces us to question how we can ethically root out hate groups like Craig Cobb's without violating the First Amendment. Next, Leap's story demonstrates the significance of space as a method of validating beliefs. For example, the Mexican Zapatistas, who demanded rights from, for Mexico's indigenous people from the government. Over 20 years old, Al Jazeera of January 1, 2014, states this group of Mayan farmers seized control of several cities and towns in Chiapas. More than two decades later, the group still remains in that area and holds similar ideologies, where they have a space to vocally resist the government. Cobb ultimately knew that if he were able to obtain control of a specific area of land, it would symbolically validate the National Socialist Movement and white supremacist beliefs. Even if his attempts would have been successful in Leith, it is unlikely that his plan would have influenced state or national politics. But his attempts highlight the terrifying reality that if similar hate groups like Cobb's adopt this model, perhaps all you need is land to move forward. After the situation in Leith calmed down, Craig Cobb vowed that he never wanted to go back to North Dakota. The citizens of Leith, though, still have trouble sleeping at night, fearing his return. Today, we saw how this tiny town was turned upside down by one man's extreme vision, how they fought back in implications. Craig Cobb's vision for a white supremacist enclave has failed, for now, but his story is one that the citizens of Leith will never forget. Neither should we. All right, Alyssa, good luck with the rest of your final rounds. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. oh. Miranda, do you need to set up? No, I'm all right. All right. All right, well then moving on down the line, we'll go to Miranda.
2007, the small Bay Area city of Richmond, California was the ninth most dangerous city in the nation, with an even higher homicide rate, despite having pumped millions of dollars into crime programs each year. A California state senator even compared the town to White Rock, where someone could be shot for something as trivial as stepping out to buy a bag of chips at the wrong time. And on the brink of declaring a state of emergency for the umpteenth time, the city council desperately solicited advice from Richmond's own convict turned counselor, Devon Bogan. Bogan, who has a felony record for street crime from his teen years, proposed a simple solution. Why don't we just identify the most likely perpetrators and pay them to stay out of trouble? <laughs> and under a $1.2 million operating budget, it's exactly what they did, forming the Office of Neighborhood Safety, or ONS, a team of reformed felons whose goal was to track down, pay off, and wait for it, mentor the 50 most violent and vulnerable youth in Richmond. And apparently it's working. Chris Manis, Richmond's police chief, states in a personal interview on July 28, 2014, that in the program's six-year run, the town's homicide rate has dropped 66%. Mm. Now, Richmond isn't the only city suffering from this level of violence. Across the country, from Sacramento to Detroit, one in every 17 U.S. <coughs> citizens will become a victim of street violence, according to the Bureau of Justice 2014. Thus, it is imperative that we gain a better understanding of ONS, an aid program which not only has the potential to decrease street violence, but also bolster social welfare in some of the nation's most dangerous cities. So today, we'll delve deeper into how the program works, as well as its limitations and its implications. Because as Andre Shoemake, a Baptist minister whose son was shot six times while riding his bicycle down a neighborhood street in Richmond says, if you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always got. Mm -hmm. Barry Kreisberg, a criminologist at UC Berkeley and an ONS team member, compares the theory behind the program to disease prevention. By inoculating the carriers of violence, maybe we can protect the whole community. The Richmond model for street violence prevention works in two stages, data mining and mentoring. Now, stage one is all numbers. The typical profile of an ONS target youth is a male between the ages of 13 and 25 with a history of gang activity, poverty, or a criminal record. Four times a year, the ONS team runs a stat analysis on police records to determine the 50 youth in Richmond who fit their profile. Then, a team of former convicts who now work for ONS take to the streets undercover and communicate with sources to keep tabs on their high-risk youth. It's a running joke within the agency that ONS is the only government entity where a criminal background is required to be an employee. <laughs> Still, Bogan insists that it's crucial, bragging that his team of felons has better intel into Richmond's down and dirty than the police. Now, stage two is the mentoring phase. After an appropriate amount of time, ONS agents will approach their target youth, establish a level of trust, and then offer the youth a spot as a fellow in the program in exchange for stopping risky behavior. If they accept, the agent then works with the youth to develop a life map and goals the completion of which can earn them a stipend of up to $1,000 a month until their 25th birthday. In addition, ONS agents provide mentorship on parole and probation, getting a GED, and in one case, even helping to raise $5,000 for a merchant marine training class. Bogan explains of the program, it's kind of like stop and frisk, except the profiled subjects are singled out for positive attention and opportunities. It didn't take long for the city to see results they credited to the program. The Richmond Police Department states in a report released in July 2014 that the city, which had been dealing with a gun murder a week, now sits at its lowest rate of homicide in nearly 40 years. Mm. Now, Bogan explains that initially, ONS had a hard time getting in with the street crowd. When agents began approaching Richmond men for enlistment, many refused, wielding guns and warning that city police would need to earn their paychecks. Additional limitations of the ONS model come on administrative and clientele levels. Initially, assimilating ONS into Richmond society has been difficult. Bogan explains to Mother Jones of July 2014 that taxpayers aren't exactly down with the program, but might be if the community, which is 70% minority, could get past outsider accusations of race baiting. 
And although Bogan has dismissed the claim as naive, it's undeniable that a whopping 100% of ONS fellows are, like Bogan, minority and male. And ONS's negative reputation is only further exacerbated by the lenience it's offered by law enforcement. Bogan explains that a provision of the program doesn't require agents to testify in court, share intel with authorities, or even respect many probation laws. Essentially, in a Richmond society, ONS is like Batman, a vigilante organization with which the police and the public are only complicit because they don't have another option. Mm. Second, life gains a whole new set of complications when Richmond youth become fellows. Four-year fellow Ronell Robinson tells the aforementioned Mother Jones that being an ONS is a difficult balance when the cops think you're a thug and your friends think you might be a narc. He states, it's like you gotta protect yourself twice. For some, the mentorship and monetary gain just isn't worth the danger. Moreover, even when fellows join the program, there's a lack of incentive to maintain a risk-free lifestyle. In October 2011, ONS held an all-fellow meeting inside their headquarters an event which meant mixing members of the most rival gangs in the city. And the fight that broke out behind closed doors of the agency that evening spurred national attention, further damaging the program's reputation. Logan explains that save from withholding the stipend, there is no way to enforce the no-violence agreement the boys enter into. And when old feuds still run, sometimes their word isn't enough. Four-year fellow Kamari Ritchell recalls the day he was won over by ONS. He tells Al Jazeera of June 28, 2014, that he was leaving the hospital paralyzed from the waist down from a gunshot wound when he was approached by a black car. Thinking it was a rival gang there to finish the job, he states, I would be dead if it wasn't for them. Implications of the Richmond model concern community welfare and the welfare system. Initially, ONS may offer evidence that crime and violence are best handled outside the realm of law enforcement. Like citizens. Dr. Gary Slutkin is the director of Cure Violence, a similarly successful anti-police program, but which operates in 22 large cities like Chicago and St. Louis. In an interview on June 26, 2014, he argues, rampant abuses of power by police, particularly in low-income areas, have fostered feelings of distrust, anger, and isolation among residents. But when violence is handled by other community members, the community is encouraged to come together speak out against the acts, appeal. From Chicago to Ferguson, it's important we consider the benefits of when violence becomes the responsibility of a community. Mm -hmm. And blame is placed not only on those who complete the acts, but those who remain complicit. Mm -hmm. Second, ONS may offer new evidence for the welfare debate. Kreisberg tells Al Jazeera of June 28, 2014, that the way America handles delinquency is miserably unproductive as crime and recidivism are linked to something that discipline just can't help. Poverty. Freakonomics author Stephen Levitt testifies that the drop in crime and gun violence in Richmond may have more to do with the cycles of poverty that were broken when the millions of annual dollars that were going into disciplinary programs were reallocated into social aid. For a country that's constantly debating and undermining the benefits of social welfare funding, Ogan's program may offer critical insight. ONS may have ultimately proven that social aid is the catalyst for a healthier community. Today, we discuss the Richmond model for street <coughs> violence prevention, its limitations and implications. In May 2014, Richmond saw the end to a 147-day murder-free streak. And of the five deaths which occurred in a two-week period, not one of them was on the radar of ONS. Still, for fellows like Ronell or Ritchell, being identified for the program has literally meant the difference between life and death. And it's now up to the city to decide if that's enough. All right, Miranda, good luck with the rest of your finals. Thank you very We have a Carly that just walked in. 
Do we have a Katie that just walked in? Okay, well then we will keep going down the line to our next double entered person, which would be Doug. All right, Doug. and costing $16,000, David was purchased by the Southern Evangelical Seminary in Matthews, North Carolina. His eyes flicker purple and green. He recognizes faces, responds to vocal cues, and can even do yoga, which is a lot more than I can do. <laughs> According to Salon.com on October 10th, 2014, David, or the digitally advanced virtual intelligence device, is a robot. And his purpose is to help the Catholic Church. But the Catholic Church doesn't, you know, science. <laughs> <laughs> or so we thought. Church Pop on August 21st, 2014 explains that the Catholic Church has made one exception when it comes to science. Robots. In fact, the Catholic Church's use of robotics was so frequent throughout history, they were on the forefront of the Industrial Revolution and fuel philosophical discussions all across the globe about artificial intelligence. And today, the convergence of robotics with theology has created a new discipline, robotic theology. On February 21st, 2014, Popular Science explains that robotic theology is being practiced by the Catholic Church, who uses autonomous humanoid robots to tackle the very questions of theology, including life and death, the immortal soul, and even the divine will. But the Popular Science article concedes that, yeah, this is weird <laughs> and counterintuitive, because most people see science and religion as the exact opposites of each other. But scholars of robotic theology, like Ann Forrest, a computer scientist and theologian at St. Bonaventure University, believe that this field of study will launch human civilization into a new era of understanding of what it truly means to be human. So today, we'll explore the field of robotic theology by examining the age-old relationship between the Catholic Church and robotics, its current state, and implications. The aforementioned Salon article explains that, believe it or not, but it will be the Catholic Church who leads our nation into the second wave of the Industrial Revolution. The father of modern computing, Charles Babbage, wrote in the Ninth Bridgewater Treaty in 1837, that God's natural laws can be directly tied to the calculating engine. See, Babbage believed that if a God did exist, that God was comparable to a modern-day nerdy computer programmer guy. <laughs> Let's explore the historical lineage between the Catholic Church and robotics by examining what they did and why. Now first, the idea and the ability to create human-like robots is uniquely Catholic. According to Dr. Jessica Riskin of Stanford University on September 1st, 2014, the Catholic Church created automata, or elaborate mechanisms driven by little springs that were the precursors to modern-day robots. Some churches had automatic heretics, and a mechanical moor's head once hung in the cathedral in Barcelona, the expression on its face changing with the intensity of the organ music. <laughs> One church even had a mechanical Jesus, or Robo-Christ, that sat on top of its building, and it moved like the animatronic rides at Disneyland. That's not creepy at all. <laughs> Second, automata attracted people to the church. The aforementioned Salon article explains that automata entertain parishioners and help philosophers and theologians sharpen their critical thinking skills about the relationship between physical motion and the immaterial soul. In their attempts to understand the divine creator, they were inspired to act like God and create life, using robots as tools for debate on how they believe God should interact with humans and, of course, technology. From this automated tradition, craftsmen developed the earliest methods that later translated into the earliest forms of industrial technology, and even computers. Now they may be distant relatives, but the robo-Christ of our medieval churches and the motherboard of a modern-day robot actually share a family tree. In 2012, Robert Gerace offered the first ever published account of cyber theology. In his book, Apocalyptic Al, he defines the rapture as the moment where human beings download our consciousness into computers, shed our physical bodies, and achieve immortality. Now, both Christians and devoted scientists believe that one day all the masses will shed our physical bodies to go live in an invisible world. 
it is time that we actually review the current state of robotic theology. First, science and religion are gradually becoming one and the same. In her 2014 book, Worlds Without End, author Mary Jane Rubinstein argues that modern advances are reconfiguring the boundaries between science and religion. Robotic theology is forcing the Catholic Church to determine if the traditional rapture narrative, where believers ascend into heaven, reconciles with the secular version, where we download our minds into robots. In that scenario, Jirachi explains that immortality can be achieved through virtual reality. That is, if we humans can successfully replicate the neurochemical activities of our own brains, we can transfer our emotions and personalities into robots to live outside of our physical bodies. So, in other words, heaven might not actually be up in the clouds, but rather be more like the cloud. <laughs> Second, robotic theology puts the Catholic Church into an interesting position. Wired.com on August 8, 2014 explains that organized religion sets the moral standards on nearly every issue throughout our global community, even for non-religious people. The origins of most of our laws and even the general sense of right and wrong were initially modeled after a church doctrine. As such, organized religion, more specifically Catholicism, will be the first to answer questions such as, is there a limit on how human like a robot can be? How should we treat anthropomorphic computers? And the inevitably icky question, is it ethical for some people to have sex with robots? <laughs> Even for agnostics and atheists, it will be the Catholic Church who initially starts the conversation surrounding the morality regarding forthcoming artificial intelligence. When Dr. Jessica Riskin was asked whether automata were primarily used to entertain parishioners or to instruct them, she rejected the question altogether, explaining that to amaze and to demonstrate are so entangled that they truly are inseparable. Let's examine two implications. First, the Catholic Church is being forced to reconcile with scientific law. According to Dr. Anders Sandberg of Oxford University on February 20, 2014, True artificial intelligence is self-aware, self-educating, and independent. And yet one of the primary doctrines of Catholicism is thou shall have no God before me. In essence, the Catholic Church is inviting in criticisms of hypocrisy at the highest level. And with each advancement of artificial intelligence, the line between God and scientist gets blurrier. However, Pope Francis has discovered a potential solution to this problem. According to the Docker Tribune on October 28, 2014, Pope Francis recently publicated, publicly validated the theory of evolution by explaining it as part of the Catholic narrative. Now this is a sign where the Catholic Church is headed, a reframing of classic Christian understandings as compatible with, and even enhanced by, scientific theory. Second, the Catholic Church is fueling the development of artificial intelligence. Now, although no one knows how much for sure, because they're not required to disclose, the Catholic Church has got mad paper. <laughs> <laughs> Which is to say that they are very, very wealthy. The Economist made calculations based on public spending in 2012 and estimated that the Catholic Church generated an estimated $150 billion just that year, just in America. Now, for context, the revenue of General Motors and Apple worldwide combined that same year was $150 billion. And as, co as governments continue to slash funding for science, the Catholic Church remains the only entity with both the resources and the interest to push robotics forward. But more importantly, The Atlantic reports on October 2nd of 2014 that the future of robotics is in healthcare. Now, far and away, the biggest expense of Catholic churches are Catholic hospitals. And where might one find the most advanced robotic surgeons, tools, strategies, and materials? As you could have imagined, Catholic hospitals. Our nation's robotic future and national health care system will be led and funded by the Catholic Church. Today we explored the fascinating field of robotic theology. As unlikely as a pair of bedfellows as imagined, robotics and the Catholic Church have a long history and will inevitably have a huge impact on our future. The aforementioned popular science article shakes its head in wonder, exclaiming that the robot David is living proof that robots are invading the worlds in ways that no human could have ever predicted.
You sure can, Doug. Good luck with those two rounds. Thank you. And Cassidy, are you no longer double entered, or do you gotta go somewhere? You're no longer double entered. All right, well then we- um, Doug just told me because we're in oratory, we're kind of double entered even though not really. <laughs> so. so we were told by um, Jen that's running the tournament uh -huh. that um, because we're in oratory and this is a nine person info, it might bleed into that. Oh, yeah. So they told us that we needed to get out ahead of time. So okay. So yeah. Who's the oratory people? Me and Daniel. And Daniel? Was, yeah. <laughs> See you okay. Later. All right, well, then we'll go to Daniel, then. Thanks. All right, Daniel, sorry. Sally 80 is not a sharpshooter. As an editor of The New Scientist, she's more used to sniping misplaced modifiers than enemy combatants. But... There she was, sitting in a basement in Carlsbad, California, grasping an M4 assault rifle, trying to defeat enemy targets and defend her battalion in a realistic war simulator. She was pretty awful. <laughs> Telling her story to the June 26, 2014 New Scientist, she said she almost gave up. Then, a worker came in and attached an electrode to her head, and another to her arm. He turned on a small amount of current and turned the game back on. AD said it was like they put the game on an easy setting. She took down enemy targets, and in a blink of an eye, she was done with the game, having earned a perfect score. Going from being practically inept to a trained killer was possible because of the use of a technique to stimulate her brain. The idea of using small amounts of current to stimulate your brain is called transcranial direct current stimulation, or TCDS. This technology has drawn thousands of subscribers online to have this discussion, and many communities on Reddit and YouTube provide instruction on how to build your own headset. As The Atlantic writes on August 13, 2013, TCDS has the potential to revolutionize our understanding of brain structures and the systems that underpin intelligence. Thus, in order to gain a deeper understanding of what TCDS is, let's take a look at its history and how to build a headset. Second, address its applications and finally, explore its implications because it's what the June 26, 2014 Radio Lab calls a 9 volt nirvana. <laughs> the idea of using electricity to stimulate your brain isn't new. Ancient Roman physician Galen once suggested slapping an electric torpedo fish on your forehead could cure a headache. <laughs> and while fish are no longer seen as an option for Advil, <laughs> it wasn't that far off. Let's take a look at the history of TCDS and how to build a headset. Thanks to a recent rise in interest, more scientists have begun to use TCDS to experiment. The man that brought modern TCDS into existence was Dr. DJ Albert, whose 1960s research proved that small amounts of current can alter brain function. That research remained largely unnoticed until a group of international scientists published a paper in 2008 Brain Stimulation Journal. This resulted in a modern renaissance in the subject, creating a slew of new data. But since then, the Food and Drug Administration won't allow doctors to prescribe it as treatment, but that may soon change. Now that we know how we got here, let's see how to build a headset. It costs less than $20. All you need is an 9-volt battery, wires, clips, sponges, saline solution, and someone who doesn't mind being shocked in the brain. <laughs> TCDS puts a very small amount of current, just 2 milliamps, in the tissue right below the scalp. And don't worry, all you'll feel is a light itchy sensation. Maren Brixton, a bioengineering professor at the City University of New York, explained how it worked on October 13, 2014. Positive current, when applied to the neurons, excites them and places them at the cusp of firing. Conversely, negative current saps energy and electrons from the neurons, decreasing activity. Michael Weizen, a researcher at the Wright State Research Institution, told the aforementioned radio lab, when your brain is figuring out a new problem, it is going through a series of neural pathways, trying to figure out what works. By placing as many neurons on the cusp of firing, messages can go across your brain even faster. While TCDS sounds like something that should have been in last summer's brain-based blockbuster, Lucy, where a woman gains almost godlike power by expanding her brain, this technology is already in use. 
although sadly without the voice of Morgan Freeman. <laughs> now, we can explore TCDS's applications. First, TCDS will revolutionize how we learn. Writing on her personal blog on November 11th, 2014, while her brain was being zapped, Sally A. remembered feeling like she just had an excellent cup of coffee without the caffeine jitters. That experience was backed by a 2010 study done by the University College of London, which tested TCDS on people who suffered strokes. They were given a number of math tests, and after just a short period of time, they learned information much faster. And it can do more than help us learn math. It can make better drone pilots. As the February 6, 2014 BBC News explains, TCDS is used to help newly enlisted pilots get over the initial learning curve of how to fly a drone. It works because it allows them to remember the steps of how to fly in a way much faster than before. In tests afterwards, their accuracy was improved by 250%. Mm -hmm. This technology could be useful in any job that requires you to remember a series of steps or have superior hand-eye coordination. Second, TCDS provides a powerful short-term memory boost, which naturally has attracted the attention of college students. <laughs> Speaking to ABC's Nightline on November 11, 2014, J.D. Lentham said he started to use TCDS to help him study for finals. When he took the test, he remembered the information down to its exact location in the textbook. This worked because, as Brian Kaufman explained in the January 2014 journal NeuroImage, the current increases the working memory and decreases some brain waves coming from visual and audio stimuli. Therefore, allowing you to have a kind of focus that is impossible to achieve just studying in a library. So, perhaps sometime in the future, students will be wearing TCDS headsets as they guzzle Americanos near the end of the semester. <laughs> <laughs> While TCDS has grabbed the attention of many, it still has one big problem. The idea of strapping electrodes to someone's head brings up cultural memories of questionable mental health institutions. But still, thousands of enthusiasts are building their own headsets using it on themselves at home. Now, we can explore TCDS's implications. First, TCDS can revolutionize our understanding of the brain and how to treat it. In 2013, a group of Brazilian scientists discovered that TCDS has similar benefits to the depression medication Zoloft. Their findings were published in the 2013 Journal of the American Medical Association. They explained that it allowed these individuals to fast forward through the depressive cycles to a time when they felt better. They also explained, this also worked on people who didn't suffer from depression. This is different from existing depression treatments because instead of altering the chemicals in the brain, like most antidepressants, it alters the firing rate of neurons. Therefore, it avo avoids some of the costs and side effects of antidepressants, having the possibility to help the millions of people that live with depression. This has a dark side as well. If TCDS can have positive reactions, the opposite is also true. As the tech blog io9 wrote on December 18, 2014, the military is looking to develop neurological weaponry, using some of the ideas found in TDCS. These include using light, energy, and magnetism to short-circuit brain function, causing mental degradation. While these technologies are far from deployment, the military is still interested in harnessing these powers on the battlefield. Perhaps they will find a way to develop neurological mustard gas, or a way to hack minds. Finally, TCDS shows us the boundaries of the brain. As Roy Cohen Kadash, a researcher at Oxford, discovered, TCDS has its costs. In his studies, he explained that some people had problems applying their newly learned information in new ways. He said this backs up a previously held theory of the brain that it may be like a computer, with only so much storage space. Therefore, increasing capabilities in one area diminishes it somewhere else. Furthermore, while the idea of using TCDS to fast forward through life's most painful moments may sound appealing, emotions such as sorrow and grief are part of being human. And the use of technology to dull these feelings, when not diagnosed as a medical disorder, is something that requires both medical and ethical dialogue. Just because we have the tools to change how we feel, doesn't mean we should always use them. Today, after discussing what TCDS is, looked at its history, how to build one, applications and implications, it's clear TDCS shows us parts of our minds that are absent before. 
While further studies and research is looming, there's little to prevent curious consumers from building their own headsets and letting the good times flow. <laughs> Sure, good luck yes, with the oratory. Good luck. We're halfway through. <laughs> um, Lindsay, do you have anything to set up? I do. Okay, if you can go ahead and start that for me. And next up is Lindsay Armstrong. The character of Robin Hood is usually envisioned as a young lad in green tights. Cute, right? <laughs> However, the face behind the Robin Hood Foundation, a cutthroat, powerful poverty-fighting organization in New York City, is actually a 60-year-old man with a receding hairline and a power suit. <laughs> So less cute, depending on what you're into. <laughs> As shared in a Robin Hood blog post from May 8th of 2014, New York City's Robin Hood Foundation was created and is run by one of New York's elite hedge fund managers, Paul Tudor Jones. 60 Minutes on May 5th, 2013 asserts, the foundation has become the city's largest private backer of charter schools, job training, and food programs, investing $132 million last year alone. Since its founding, Robin Hood has become a foundation unlike any other. It has developed an algorithmic system to help it invest in only the top producing anti-poverty organizations in New York City. Out of the 9,700 organizations fighting for attention, Robin Hood selects the 200 they find to have the most potential return to society and each year cuts off funding to underperforming charities creating a competitive environment. As its mission states, 100% of donations are given directly to those organizations the foundation supports because all fundraising and operational costs are covered by the board of directors. Robin Hood has become so successful that Forbes on April 8, 2014, shares two other cities, San Francisco and Chicago, have both launched programs based on similar principles. Robin Hood's uncharitable approach to charity has been both hailed as the future of philanthropy and criticized for being overly technical and dispassionate, thus warranting further attention. Today, we will first examine Robin Hood's background and operations. Next, look to the assistance it provides to its grantees before finally deriving implications. To fully understand what Eric Schmidt, executive chairman of Google, asserts, is the most efficient and effective nonprofit in America today. From Lady Gaga to fun, countless Grammy award-winning superstars helped Robin Hood during their extravagant galas. Attended by New York's elite, the May 2014 gala brought in $60 million in just one night. To understand how Robin Hood disperses this money, we will first look at its background and operations. First, run by a successful hedge fund manager, it's unsurprising Robin Hood tries to measure and, out and find outcomes for variable measures. For instance, they have developed an algorithm to help it invest in only the top producing anti-poverty organizations in New York City. Michael Weinstein, chief program officer of Robin Hood, shares its process in his 2013 book, The Robin Hood Rules for Smart Giving. First, they identify the mission-relevant outcome of a grant. For instance, an education program with a $400,000 grant benefiting 100 middle school students to better their education. 
As a result, an additional 25 students graduate high school. Next, staff monetizes the value of action, assigning dollar values to outcomes such as increased earnings as a result of being a graduate and longer and healthier lives. Ultimately, a dollar figure is given to the amount of philanthropic good a grant does per dollar of cost by using a cost-benefit ratio. So, total benefits of $5.25 million divided by the original cost of $400,000 equals $13, the amount returned to society per every dollar spent. Essentially, Robinhood has created a system to compare apples to oranges. Second, according to its website, last updated 2014, Tudor Jones mentioned in the aforementioned 60 Minutes interview that every year 5% to 10% of grantees are defunded. He explains, this is simply because they're not getting the results. According to the Chronicle of Philanthropy on June 20th of 2013, before Robinhood invests in an organization, it quantifies the expectations of the project and then assesses how close it came. If said organization has not reached their benchmarks after one year, the organization is then given another year and more assistance for improvement. If by the third year the organization has still fallen short, support is cut off. Now that we have a better understanding of Robinhood's background and operations, we can now look to the assistance it provides to its grantees. First, as mentioned on its website, Robinhood provides real estate assistance to its grantees. From decision making on whether to rent or build, Robinhood staff works with organizations to help understand cost and minimize risk on real estate decisions. For instance, Robinhood's assistants allow POTS, a soup kitchen in New York, to build a new facility with triple the storage space and room for programming. When first visiting the soup kitchen in the Bronx, the previously cited 60 Minutes interview shares, the foundation immediately asked for data. A five-year strategic plan was created, and with the help of $5 million of Robin Hood's money, the kitchen now serves twice the amount of people as before. Second, according to Charity Inn Navigator, last updated 2014, Robin Hood boasts a perfect four of four stars rating and a 99% score of 100, thus proving the results Robin Hood produces are incredible and incomparable to others in their area. Since its founding, over $1.1 billion have been distributed to help fight poverty in New York City. Its education and GED programs are so successful. They boast a 75% increase in chance of passing the GED. Their job training programs are two times as effective as others in their area, as they yield high rates of increased salaries and job retention. Lastly, and very importantly, 92% of people who enter a housing program funded by Robinhood don't return to shelters. After examining Robinhood's background and operations and the assistance it provides to its grantees, we can now derive two critical implications. First, Robinhood financializes our approach to philanthropy. Essentially, and unsurprisingly, it operates as a hedge fund of charities, with investors and operators focused on one goal, getting the most philanthropic return on investment possible. While this financial attitude pushes innovation, it can also mean that organizations who were unable to demonstrate operational outcomes are left behind. For instance, take Alzheimer's, a debilitating disease and the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. Partly since there is no cure or no return on investment, funding is decreased. So much so, in fact, that the Denver Post of July 24th, 2014 reports, Alzheimer's research receives one-tenth the amount of funding of cancer research, even though its mortality rate is comparable. Now, by focusing so heavily on these operational outcomes, this hedge fund operation is potentially leaving many worthy causes back in the dust. Second, because Robinhood's metrics require the monetization of each outcome, the values of these actions may be overlooked. Trying to quantify good deeds and generalizing the experience may desensitize the value of the action. Thus, some programs that may seem inefficient to Robin Hood standards, but have a large, profound impact to its participants, could miss out on critical funding opportunities. In